day and welcome to our Valentine's Day edition of the Constitution of American Life with the Friends of Publius. I am David Richmond. Uh, I have been involved in the We the People program since its inception in 1986. Uh, we also have Professor Chris Cavanaugh from Bismarck, North Dakota, North, North Dakota by way of, uh, uh, of Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, uh, who is a highly recognized award-winning civic education uh, teacher and has been involved in We the People for, again, a couple of decades here. Along with uh, Chris and I, we also have Professor Tim Moore, a former high school teacher uh, who taught We the People and now is on staff with the Center for the Study of the Constitution uh, with John Kaminsky, the guru of the ratification uh, period. And of course, we have our rock star, Professor James Michael uh, Williams, uh, Professor of Political Science uh, and International Relations at the University of San Diego and our foremost expert on rap stars and rap music. Uh, I, I say that to you because of course we are, uh, we are talking to you uh, the day after many Americans experienced the longest commercial for consumerism in American history, interrupted briefly, interrupted briefly by a football game and a mini concert, if you want to call it that. Uh, I was funny, I was reading about the Major League Baseball negotiations and, and I read the comment section of some guy bagged on baseball, you know, with all these commercial interruptions. And then I watched the Super Bowl. And I got to say, there's 10 minutes of commercials for every two minutes of action uh, going on there, if you want to call it uh, action. Uh, and of course, from that experience, only one member of this panel is celebrating today the LA Rams victory in the Super Bowl. The first, by the way, for the Los Angeles uh, Rams team in history. They did win a Super Bowl as the St. Louis uh, Rams, but uh, never as the Los Angeles Rams. So a historic moment in so many ways. Talking about historic moments uh, tonight, this topic is uh, gonna ask us all to address what some scholars have identified as the dark soul of the American nation. Every nation, in my opinion, has a malignant cancer that challenges the very nature of its national identity. For the English, it was the Irish. Uh, for India, it is the untouchables. For continental Europe, it was the Jews. For the US, it is slavery, segregation, and race. One of the most radical statements in the history of man was written down in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. This was written at a time and in the context of history in which almost nobody believed it or practiced it. We have been aspiring to attain this goal for 233 years. There are a number of issues and questions we hope to address this evening. First and foremost, to what de degree do we as a people have a national consensus on the meaning of equal protection and discrimination? To what extent was World War II, and hopefully something we can get into, the major, and I know it makes Mr. Moore nervous when we talk about the major or most important, but the major turning point societally in our understanding of equality and the damaging impact of segregation. We need to ask what impact has cognitive and behavioral science had on the question of whether you can have a republic based upon equality in a diverse nation when tribalism may be the natural state of mankind. And lastly, looking at the public policy side, we do need to investigate whether or not race and ethnic-based affirmative action programs did more good or harm in the long run for this American Republic. Hope to address those topics and hopefully a few more in our conversation here for the next hour. So let's start off with kind of what's become our tradition, and that is try to help students and teachers uh, deconstruct to a certain degree uh, the question. So gentlemen, what recommendations would you make to teachers and students on how to approach this question on one, the evolving nature of equality, that is how has culture all right, the evolution of American society in any way impacted uh, the notion of equality under the law and the judicial application, all right, of the Equal Protection uh, Clause. 
so uh, Professor Moore, we'll start with you. What suggestions might you make to teachers and students? Well, I think um, I just want to just re um, emphasize a couple of key words in your introduction here to this question. I think students would be uh, off track if they just stuck to law on this question. Because uh, in many ways, the way it's written, the way I see it is, this is a cultural question. Um, and so I, I would urge students to not get lost in all of the court cases that you're going to run across that have tried to flesh out the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, at root, I perceive this to be a cultural question. And so uh, to your point, David, um, that, that, uh, that is critical, I, I think, for, for uh, students to, to realize. This is a cultural question as much as it is law, maybe even more so. Chris? Um, I, I would definitely agree with what Tim said. And I would also make sure that uh, students understand that the, the quote in the root of the question is one from uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall. And, you know, you understand, I think you can understand more so the quote if you actually maybe do a deep dive into, into some of his background as the, on the, um, you know, as an attorney for the NAACP legal defense team. And if you look at his early career as an attorney traveling through the South, trying to represent African Americans and, you know, the point where he was almost lynched at one point. Um, so there's the law, right? And then there's society. And I think that speaks to Tim's point in terms of culture. Um, uh, because if you're going to try and get there's so much case law in the 14th Amendment. It's, uh, it's, it, it would drive you crazy to try and get into it. But I think there's a much more passionate argument to be thinking about policy and culture and culture and policy. I had to chuckle, Chris, when uh, I first read this uh, question, especially in reference to last week, uh, or I, I don't know if it was last week or previous episode, when you pretty much kept pounding the idea it's what five people on the Supreme Court says it is. And so I think about Marshall's quote, and he talks about succeeding generations, and I'm assuming he's talking about the body politic here, and maybe it's far narrow, narrower in that it's what five members of the Supreme Court uh, believe equal equality and equal protection uh, are. So, Mike, uh, your recommendations? Yeah, well, I, I just want to highlight first, I thought your opening was really, really insightful and I just want the the way you kind of talked about every society having their own kind of cancer they have to deal with I think that's really something students should think about just broadly speaking and it really that insight alone really kind of explodes the notion of U.S. exceptionalism in in a in a really profound way so I just thought that was a really good opening um yeah I'd agree with what Tim and Chris say and I guess I read the quote, Dave, kind of like you, I read, well, is Justice Marshall, he, he's, he's talking simultaneously to the nine people on the court, right? We have to ask ourselves, and students should be asking, these words have not been changed since 1868, and yet whether you're Justice Harlan or Justice Marshall or Justice O'Connor or Justice Kavanaugh, you may read them differently, and that's, that's really interesting. But what influences those justices is the time that they are in and the time that they have the context they're in. So I would just echo what, what everyone's been saying. If you are going to rely upon some case law, which I think you need to do, I don't think you should do too much of it, but putting those cases into the broader cultural, political, economic context, I think would be really useful for you to have in mind as you're answering the question. Well, it's a good transition. Uh, and. For one of those rare moments, I'm going to turn to you first, uh, Professor Williams, uh, given your background uh, in law uh, and as you just advocated that uh, there is a there's a middle ground between I think uh, what Tim and I were maybe referencing and uh, and I agree that you know you, you can't escape case law here, but there's just, just got to be some moderation, but we do need some kind of definition. Mm -hmm. I think students do need to lay out. Uh, for their audience, what their understanding of two key concepts or terms in this question, and one is, you know, or, or phrases, what is your legal understanding of equal protection of the law? And then also, 
what is your legal understanding of what discrimination is legally? Yeah. Right. And it's kind of like, to me, the answer is kind of like two sides of the same coin, maybe. So in terms of equal protection, um, I mean, first of all, the students know this is applying to what a governing body is doing, a, a state or a federal governing body. And if what equal protection means legally is if two individuals need to be treated in the same manner as others when they're in a similar condition or a similar circumstance. So that's like, to me, the, the foundation. Um, and to discriminate, it means the exact kind of flip side of that. To discriminate is to distinguish, is to, is to um, somehow see as different than. So to discriminate is to make see the difference, whereas to treat equally would be to treat people the same in a similar circumstance. So just a quick example, um, two people want to get married, right? And in, in one case, if you are, let's just use the case of um, you're two white people who want to get married and the law says you can get married, right? And there's another law that's written that says, but we're not going to allow if you are white or if you are black, you cannot get married. So those are, those are two sets of people, right, in a similar situation who are asking to be married. And if the law is treating them differently, then that may be an equal protection violation. We have to go through the equal protection analysis. Does that, does right. that help to get it started? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I think it, 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 you know, if we could remember <laughs> through this discussion to try to keep that framework, uh, although there's not maybe, there probably is some differing views there, I thought it laid a good foundation. So Chris, I hope this question makes sense uh, to you uh, because uh, as Tim articulated, Kids do need to pay attention to the phrase societal change that was that's within the question. To me, that means culture, all right, and how culture uh, changes. And so I'm wondering, to what degree do the words of the 14th Amendment, specifically the Equal Protection Clause, take precedence over culture, or does culture take precedence of precedence over words? And my exam my example here is, and, and, I, and, and maybe we can use this as one case study. We look at the words and we look at, let's say, those first 10 years of Reconstruction. No state shall deny any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the law, all right? To me, that seems pretty straightforward, yet that does run into a cultural norm or a cultural belief that may not accept that. And by 1896, what I see is a cultural reading of that language in Plessy versus Ferguson. And so to me in Plessy, culture seems to take precedence over language. So does that help kind of give you a, a framework? I, I, of I, I agree wholeheartedly. I agree wholeheartedly. I think, and I think we need to also think about too, and I, I'm sorry, this is one of my pet peeves is are, are the slaughterhouse cases of 1873 and two years later, uh, U.S. v. Cruikshank, uh, which is a case that case the kids might want to look up as well, um, because what you get is a reading out of the words privileges and immunities. Um, and there, there, and, and if you, you know, for all the, you, the originalists out there, go back and read the words of John Bingham and Jacob Howard, John Bingham uh, from Ohio, Congressman and Jacob Howard, the Senator from Michigan, who were the authors of the 14th Amendment, and look what they had to say about privileges and immunities, because that was in, in relationship to the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It was in relationship to McCulloch v. Maryland. So they're writing this, crafting this document, um, the 14th Amendment, that is, specifically with language in there for these very reasons to make sure rights of people are protected. All people are protected, citizen and non-citizen, and they say this as well. And so, yes, David, I would say wholeheartedly, um, when you get to, to Plessy, you have culture running headlong into the language and intent of the 14th Amendment and its framers. And therefore, you, I, I, I would see us with Plessy taking a step back from that. So in, in, in the history of jurisprudence dealing with equal protection, to what extent do you think culture has played much more of a role than the, than the literal understanding? I know that's, that's kind of broad and maybe sure. hypothetical, but I'm just kind of wondering what your thoughts are about that. Well, I mean, 
I guess I, it's hard for me to say because I some of the cases I would use, I I think the court decided rightly. You know, I think the court decided rightly in terms of the expansion of rights to people, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of gender, regardless of, uh, well, I'll use the term race. I don't like to use the term race, but we use it. Um, so I, you know, I always think about this is what changed from, from Plessy, right, to Brown? The law didn't change, right? The law didn't change. Um, so what changed? Um, then you think about um, uh, shoot. Gosh, well, can Bowers. I jump in? Can I jump in, Chris? Is so. Would you agree that Brown itself is is just now a different cultural reflection? There, Brown is not reading the language of the Fourteenth Amendment right, literally, right? Right, because Warren uses you know not just history, but he uses social sciences in a broad sense. Oh yeah, to come to the conclusions now. So so. Sure. It is a good example of how culture or societal change from 1868 to 1896. I don't know if that's a change uh, necessarily, but let's assume. Uh, yeah, for, well, I would say it, post, you know, 18, you know, uh, 1868 and the, and the drafting and, and the ratification to 1896, there's not much of a cultural change. And you see that embedded in Plessy, but you go Plessy to Brown, you do see that cultural change. And the other case I was going to mention was Bowers v. Hardwick to Lawrence v. Texas, and then from Lawrence to Obergefell. So uh, Obergefell v. Hodges, which was a same-sex marriage case, right? So I think that you do see um, society changes, cultural changes reflected in Supreme Court decisions. But I don't know there's that a, that's always... Sorry, I think there's an argument to be made too that Brown uh, is also a foreign policy decision. Uh, remember, students would be well to think about uh, the Cold War as a cultural contest, which, um, you know, does the, does the United States culture uh, superior to, uh, you know, the, the, the Soviet culture? So um, when the, Soviet, the Soviets have a field day with uh, American segregation, uh, oh, you think, you think you're all that in a bag of chips? How about your African Americans that are segregated? So... So I think the cultural context of the Cold War and silencing the Soviet propaganda, exploiting American segregation, I think also plays into you know, everything that Chris has mentioned. What's changed? Uh, the law hasn't. It's an interpretation of the law, I would say. But also, there's a Cold War overlay, I think, to Brown. And I think some historians now are visiting that uh, heavily, whereas maybe in the first 20 years of Brown, they didn't think about that as much. Professor Williams? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, the word culture is so big. And as you were talking, I was thinking, I mean, I mean, yeah, that's not a criticism, but I couldn't help but think about apartheid in South Africa. So just give me a second here. Apartheid was justified like of in terms of it was a moral system because all, all apartheid was doing was allowing whites to be with whites and allowing Zulus to be with Zulus. And they presented it as this is exactly the way human beings want to be. So we are not going to mix people because they don't want to be mixed. Now, in the American context, I see like Lincoln before he's president, right? He says, look, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And what he's talking about there to me is a, a story of a national identity. So we come out of the Civil War and at least the radical Republicans and, and newly freed, uh, freed slaves, they, they have this story of let's become one nation, right? And by the time we get to Plessy, I see Plessy as kind of like, you know what? That's too hard, or we don't want to do that. As long as Blacks can, can ex have um, be situated in a similar uh, public accommodation, right, then we can separate. And by the time we get to Brown, there's a new conception of that is not working out, and we, we cannot be one nation. And I think World War II has a lot to do with it, the Cold War, all those, but I see it as for me, culture, there's a way to sort of subdivide that and think about national identity more specifically and how that story plays out. Well, but there are, and I agree with you, Mike, and I, I think that South African reference is, is very important and internet or, you know, global perspectives, very important so that we don't get buried in American exceptionalism and uh, kind of situations. I'm not pushing back on you, Tim. I agree wholeheartedly. Uh, scholarship looking at the Cold War and civil rights 
uh, and their, their interaction with each other is very important. But it seems to me that the, the, the changes that are going on with civil rights, specifically with equality uh, under the law, you know, begin before Brown. And, that, and I, I'm just wondering if you guys agree with me that, that World War II is the seminal moment. And, and, and that, that, that it's, a, it's an event that forces us to look inward because we are fighting our two major con- antagonists here are, are racist fascist systems, all right, who make d- very, very strong racial distinctions. We're trying to play the guys in the white hats that uh, we are different and, and therefore more advanced, better in this. Uh, yeah, you know, it's it's almost I think of a comedian, you know, as we're as we're questioning Germany about its Jewish policy, you know, Hitler's going, uh, what about your African American policy? And and I think most of you know that a lot of the the racial policies of Germany were adapted from the United States racial policies uh, 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 in that sense. So World War II to me is this is this huge transcending moment culturally for America. We come out of it with a whole, you know, emerging, different emerging idea of equality because, you know, Truman desegregates the military in what, 1946, 47? Uh, There, I I don't know if what year it is uh, uh, in that sense. So I guess one, do you guys agree that that is kind of, you know, when we look at societal change vis-a-vis the Equal Protection Clause? I know that there's been lawsuits. I know that there's been some minimal progress in the 1930s with some cases, yet we see an explosion post-World War II. So do you guys agree with me that that is is maybe an event that students need to look at and understand its impact on the societal beliefs of of, of our nation or am am I off a little bit, Tim? I can meet you halfway on that, David. Um, I think, I'm not willing to concede that uh, American segregation and discrimination is the same as extermination. Um, now, now I do, I do, I, I do agree with you that there is a connection there, and I think for American policy, um, it's it's we're a you know we're a step from. And so there's the fear that uh, our policies of segregation and discrimination, this is what it could wind up as. But I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, uh, I'd have to think about this a lot more. Uh, <laughs> but my, my first response is I'm not sure I'm, I'm making a, that I would make a moral equi- equivalency to the two. With um, the moral equivalency to what two things? Uh, the American segregation. Now, lynching aside, um, you know, and several thousand lynchings um, is is awful, uh, is terrible. But I, I'm not sure that that's the same kind of evil. Well, and I wasn't trying to make a moral equivalence of the Holocaust, you know, uh, yeah. you know to segregation. And, and but I, I do think there's a moral equivalence to the Nuremberg laws. Oh, sure. And Jim Absolutely. Crow laws. Right. That's the moral equivalence I was trying to make. And I've, I've been reading a lot about the impact of American scientific thought on race, yeah. all right? Uh, whether we look at social Darwinism or eugenics, all right, and its impact on German racial policy towards Jews. And as we know, the Holocaust, as we understand it, doesn't really take off as far as the extermination process until really World War II starts. Right. There's an anti, there's a Jewish race policy that's going on to, to me that's very similar. And I'm reading a lot of scholars who say that, you know, they, they you know, that there's, there's a relationship between the United States and Germany uh, in those policies. But do you agree, Tim, that World War II is the seminal societal ch- I do. moment that sparks the change? I, I do. Uh, that's, uh, that's our come to Jesus moment. I, I think it is. I think you're right. Uh, and if you're expecting a fight out of, out of me on that, I'm not, I'm not going to give it to you. But, no. but I, do, I think the, the consequences of looking at uh, uh, the tribalization of society and the, and the segregation and what it could wind up as is fundamentally important uh, to the civil rights movement here in America. Chris or Mike, thoughts on this line? Um, well, first of all, I would uh, tell students to ch- pick a, uh, check out a book called Cast, C-S-T-E, by Wilkerson, the same woman who wrote The Warmth of Other Sons, 
And there's an entire chapter of how our race laws influence what happened at the Nuremberg laws. As a matter of fact, was crazy they they thought there was one law that we had that they thought well, there's no way we can do this because it just as makes no sense and that's the one drop rule right so we had policies in this country that were too reactionary for nazis yep. i mean think about that in terms of our race laws and so i absolutely because we had you had people at the nuremberg that were writing the nuremberg laws who had studied law in this country and now they're writing laws in their country. How can we segregate out the Jewish population, right, from the rest of the German population? And they're looking, well, let's look and see what America's done, because they've been very successful in segregating out their black population from their white population. And yeah, you're right, Tim, it, it's not extermination, but it's certainly segregation. Uh, and our, our policies were uh, influential in, in determining the German policies in, in their early stages of the Hitler's final solution. And I don't, I would not agree that the World War II is a seminal moment because all you have to do is look to see the policies in 1946 and 1947, right? Look at the GI Bill. Look at this, the GI Bill was not applied equally to black uh, GIs and white GIs. Look at the Levitt brothers. They're not gonna sell to African-Americans. So it takes, it takes a while. I don't know that World War II is the seminal moment. Mike? Yeah, I'm not gonna go that strong. I'm gonna push back a little bit. And, but I, yeah, I don't think when we held that mirror, like you're kind of saying, we hold a mirror up, we're like, oh my gosh, we're so hypocritical, we just fought this. I don't, I don't think we, we reflected that deeply about what we were seeing in the mirror as quickly as maybe you were- I didn't say, I did not say quickly. I, I mean, to, to me, it's this, it's the, it's, it's the, it, it is the moment Okay. in which we start to see transition so in I, cultural change. There's, a, would, there's an awakening. I would, I would open up that a little bit and maybe talk about the early 30s. I think it's about a lived experience, right? The Great Depression, the migration north of many Blacks from the South, along with the desegregation that happens in the military. I think all those lived experiences, I do think that's critically important because for the first time we may be able to tell stories to ourselves um, where we can't dehumanize an entire race because we might have been in a fighting with someone who was a black American, right? Or we might have been standing in a, in a bread line with someone who was a black American. I, I would think about those lived experiences during this time period, I think were transformational um, more so than the moment of World War II itself. So Tim, the, the 14th Amendment, the framers of the 14th Amendment are clearly addressed. We, we've talked about this numerous times. These are considered Reconstruction, Civil War amendments. Civil War is overwhelmingly about uh, slavery and then, you know, what, what a post-slavery society would look like. And so they clearly focus their attention on newly established freedmen, yet they write this amendment in such a broad language that allows all other groups, Interestingly enough, except for women, to be included under the 14th Amendment. Do you think this was intentional? Uh, I do, and I'm largely basing that on my conversations that I've had with Chris over the years, because uh, Chris, Chris has, has done an extensive deep dive and a continuing deep dive into Bingham and Howard, uh, principally uh, two of the principal um, congressman involved in drafting this. So, so I think it was intentional. And, and I think that's it within uh, a great tradition of American legal writing, uh, that things are brought. I mean, think of the declaration, how broad that is. Uh, so I, I think it is in a tradition of American legalese to make things broad, um, to give some room. Well, before uh, we further, defer, before we further defer interpretation. To, yeah, to Chris, I guess, you know, was there a consciousness in your historical understanding, Professor Moore, that there were other groups out there that would need protection? Well, I think I think there was some degree of, of um, humility in them perceiving that there's no way they could with in uh, in a single stroke define all the meanings of what they're writing at the time. I mean, Madison says this says this. Um, 
you know, in so many words that it's, it's uh, down the road that will give meaning to what we're doing now. So I think they're in line with, with the first founding period in, in writing things that are broad. Chris, uh, Tim referenced you as the, the guru here. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> um, so the question is, David, do you think they're thinking about other groups? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and what brings it up is I, I find interesting is one of the earlier cases is Yikwo versus Hopkins, which deals with, you know, sure. the Chinese. And I'm wondering, was that even on the radar when they're writing this, that th this would encompass? Well, I, there's a quote, and I was trying to find it earlier, and I was pressed for time. And I, boy, I, it, if the students can find this from Bingham, and he says that no matter under what sky you were born or what sun you were born and what air you breathed is to, to apply to you, right? And that's pretty encompassing. And um, I, I would say they wrote the language of the 14th Amendment specifically um, to their taking a look at um, Article 4, and the Privileges and Immunities Clause in Article 4. They're looking at the Due Process Clause in the Fifth Amendment. They're looking at uh, uh, the opinion of McCulloch v. Maryland. And they're looking at the language of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And so the, is their design to protect all people from the state governments? And it's, you know, it's the whole idea of incorporation. If you go back to what these guys were writing, they believed, holy cow, they believed that these privileges and immunities were the first eight amendments to the Constitution. They even said so much in speeches. They just assumed that this would, these would apply to all persons. But of course, through legal wranglings and interpretations in the slaughterhouse, um, they don't. And so we were left with the, uh, you know, the whole process of selective incorporation. Well, I find it's interesting that this is 20 years after Seneca Falls. And so clearly, the women's rights issue is, is, is not some, you know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, back of the book kind of uh, uh, element here. So why why didn't they or, or did they include women? That's a great question, David. And I'm not sure I know the answer because in my readings, I've never really seen gender discussed that much. Not nearly as much because, you know, if you think about the early, early women's rights movements, you know, early stuff, like you were mentioning Seneca Falls. Well, you know, they, they're not going to be able to get anywhere without the support of some men. And they end up, you know, the, they end up, uh, the suffrage movement ends up hitching their wagon to the abolitionist movement. And this basically, oh, just wait, just wait, we'll get to you, right? Well, well okay, now we, we've abolished slavery. No, no, now we have to incorporate these newly freed men into society. How are we going to do that, right? So it's, women are, you know, continually pushed off to the side in this, in this discussion, which is really frustrating. I think it was uh, um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was on her honeymoon, right? And she, and I, I might get this story incorrect, but she's on her honeymoon with her husband in London. And it's an international um, uh, meeting of abolitionism, right? And she and another woman are the only two women attending. And it throws the whole convention into a tizzy because are we going to set, we're, are we going to seek these women at, a, at a, an international conference, uh, you know, dealing with abolition of slavery? And they, the compromise was, I think they put them up in a balcony behind a curtain. And the <laughs> irony of that whole thing is, is mind-blowing. Mike, uh, thoughts yeah, about I, this? Yeah, I would just add a couple of things. I read this week, and Chris, uh, Chris, please correct me if I misread this, but that for sure Bingham and others were thinking about white unionists and how they were being treated by the former Confederacy. So they definitely thought that as a group, they, they wanted to make sure the 14th Amendment was going to protect those people. Um, and also, I think this is, I mean, I think Eric Foner is one of many historians who brought this up, that um, it's not like Bingham and the, the, the folks who were drafting the 14th Amendment didn't know that, that women were demanding the same rights. It, it's, it's the C word, right? It's compromise. It's, it's just like we know that Madison and others in 1787 knew that slavery was an issue. They knew that, but they just felt that to get what needed to be done, to get it done politically, that to bring women into the conversation, they may have not have gotten the votes. 
that's my understanding of the actual politics that was going on. Um, well, I mean, there's only so much energy, right? You know, and there's only so far you can push things. Yeah. And so the idea of having the yeah. political will. And that's a cultural, will. I mean, the cultural context is race. The cultural context of the Civil War amendments is race. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's not gender. So I think, uh, you know, this, this notion that uh, not now, not now, um, I, that's that cultural context that I, that I don't want to lose here um, in, our, in our discussions. Well, to speak of the cultural context, simply look at some Supreme Court opinions and what they're saying in certain cases uh, about the role of women in society. Yeah, right? two spheres, right. The, yeah, yeah the two sphere theory right exactly yeah. yep so this next one is actually i'd like chris you and mike to kind of deal with and then if tim and i have anything to, to add on to it uh and I, so i'd like to shift a little bit to the legal side of it uh because kids are asked to, to deal with Good night, cleveland you've been a great audience <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I know this is not let me know when the 1790s come back <laughs> 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 As 1790s so, kids, 1790s. So I, I don't know the genesis. I don't know when this came to light, but there is a, kind of an approach, a judicial analytical approach uh, to equal protection, levels of scrutiny uh, and, uh, and distinctions. Uh, so the distinctions we make might uh, have certain different kinds of scrutiny that the court uh, takes, uh, Chris. So first of all, does, does that need to be revamped? All right. Uh, does the levels of scrutiny need to be revamped? And, and then while you're thinking, I'm going to give you some time to think about that, because I want to ask Mike if he could at some point in the conversation. It seems to me if, if we're going to have these levels of scrutiny, all right, and they're based upon distinctions or classifications. All right. So we have a rational basis. We have intermediate scrutiny and we have strict scrutiny that the very nature of that judicial set of tools tells us that discrimination is acceptable in our country, all right, in, 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 in certain contexts. Is, is, is that logical? I mean, am I making a lot that, that the, the judicial uh, system is, is, you know, kind of gives kids a clear answer to this notion of, is it ever okay to discriminate? Well, of course it is if you have these different levels of scrutiny and these different levels of classifications. So I don't know who wants to go first with that kind of stuff, but there you are, play around for a while. Well, it makes me, it, thanks. It, it makes me think of uh, Orwell an Animal Farm, right? And so when the animals take over the farm and they say all animals are created equal, and then as the, you know, as the pigs get control and they try to change it up, uh, some animals are more equal than others. That's what the levels of scrutiny make me think of. Because again, if you go back to the language and you're just, whether you want to be an originalist or a textualist here, how do you get away from the idea of saying, okay, all persons are entitled to this. All persons are entitled to that or privileges and immunities, which of course the court, you know, they're cowards and they don't want to revisit Slaughterhouse. They don't want to revisit Cruikshank. They, be, they you know, because that would be too messy for them because we, we'd be able to fall into this nice little niche of, you know, equal protection and due process. But I, I do think that they need to be revisited. And that's just me being somewhat radical and oversimplified is that there's no need to have these things. Uh, because, of course, now we have to get into how fundamental of a right is it, right? What's, is, is a right, some rights are more important than others. And so now we've gotten into this rights classification. So because we've gotten into rights classification, now we have to get into judicial interpretation classification, whether there's, you know, a rational basis, mid-tier or strict scrutiny, which I guess well, you're just... Help me out for a minute, Chris. Sus did suspect class when it first comes into the language of the court? All right. It was, it was race, ethnicity. All right. Did it include religion initially? Um, I don't. I don't think so. See, I'm wondering if, you know, again, it seemed to me that that suspect class would deal with issues that are, of, of persons that have a. Yeah, well, no, Dave, you're, it is religion. It's, it's race, national origin, religion and alienage. 
and then it evolves into the fundamental rights doctrine. So we expand it beyond religion. Mike wants to jump in because he seems like he's got. Well, no, I just, well, I just, okay, I just want to take a step back for the, the students here. To make law and to practice politics, it's, it's a practice of differentiating. It's a practice of discriminating, right? You have to decide um, at what point do we want to put in the law uh, what income point do we tax you at 20% versus 15%? Like you're treating people differently. That's what lawmaking is about. So you're right, David, this notion of like, we all laws discriminate. Yes, that's, that's what they do. The government still has to though, provide a reason for it. Right. And the rational basis is the lowest, like, just, just tell us like that you had a reason at all to do this. Right. My understanding then after the 14th Amendment, is that now the courts are having to deal with, okay, um, how do we square equal protection of the law with this notion that to make laws is to, to discriminate? And there are two separate ways you do equal protection analysis. One is, is there a suspect classification at stake? And if you can find one or make an argument for one, and that, as you're right, that started off, I think with, I think maybe race, religion and alienage, and then it has expanded. And or is there a fundamental right at stake? Now, students who are watching this, who've been doing this program long enough to know, those are not like multiple choice questions, right? Or true, false. Those are arguments, right? There are arguments about what is a fundamental right. There are arguments about what are suspect classifications. But once you fall into those two categories, the rationale the government has to make to discriminate, it, the bar is raised, right? To strict scrutiny. And the government can still even discriminate um, when a fundamental right is at stake, if they can make an argument. Like for example, voting is a fundamental right. And the Supreme Court has said that state laws that say that you cannot lobby someone for their vote, I think it's within a hundred yards of the polling place, that is allowed. Like you can just stop that free speech from happening because you have free speech and voting, both fundamental rights, and in this case, we're going to protect the right to vote. So you can show a compelling state interest if you're the government to still get it done. I actually have a question. You know, if I'm, if my memory serves correct, didn't all of this come out of a glib statement out of the court that, you know, going, this is in the 30s, I think, going forward, we're going to pay attention to uh, discrete and insular minorities. Yeah. So I, I guess my question is, was that helpful to describe groups that we're going to really pay attention to uh, that may be discriminated against in the past and calling them discrete and insular minorities. That doesn't sound very helpful to me. Sounds like a cop-out, doesn't it? Well, it, it, it kind of does. Or an invitation to, to roam around and uh, find people that fit, you know, beyond just alienage and religion and, um, you know, race and ethnicity. It, it just seems like an invitation to find more and doesn't that, in a sense, compound the problems of interpreting equal protection? I don't, I, I'm not I mean, sure if I quite I've understand. just never understood footnote four. I've really never understood students, what that means. Students, what Tim is referring to, I'm sure many of you already know this is footnote from number four in the Caroline Products case, yeah. which is a, a kind of a, I don't want to say that it's a case is inconsequential. The footnote is much more consequential than the yeah. case itself. I, I think, in theory, um, that notion of footnote four, it, it kind of, it, it saves our democratic pr practice. I mean, and it, it is going to switch over time. I mean, the whole idea at the founding was that, Federalist 10, right, is that we were going to have these moving factions. No one was ever going to be in the permanent minority, that the democracy would work for you. And I think what the court, I think that's 1939, right? I think the court says, if you, if you can show that you're discrete and so like you're never going to be on the winning team. <laughs> and the majority is always in perpetuity going to pass laws to discriminate against you, then we're going to make that harder for the government. And while maybe those who are transgendered wasn't on the mind of the court in the 1930s, maybe there's an argument to be made now for that group as a suspect class, you know, as a suspect, suspect class. So I don't have a problem with that group changing as as our democracy changes and we see who, who has access to power and who doesn't. Which, but are you willing to concede that it compounds the problem? 
What, which problem? Of filling in the meaning of discrete and insular. <laughs> People in search of, right? They're, oh. Now they're in search of that category. Yeah, of course. Of course it does, yeah. Which, which takes me back, ugh, takes me back to the language of the 14th. How hard is it to say all persons, period? If, if we simply lived well, up to the language of the yeah, but I don't want a blind brush. I don't want a, I don't want a blind <laughs> applicant driving the city bus. I mean, I want that kind of discrimination. That's right. that seems to be pretty rational. Well, I know I'm, I'm with Mike because I was I listened to what Mike said and I was thinking of the late great Stan. Right. Uh, if you guys uh, Stan Harris, the uh, longtime Indiana teacher and our state coordinator for a long time and, and would have what a lovely man who called it just like it was. And he said, all laws discriminate, right? Which is true. And so, yeah, we don't want blind people driving the city bus, right? But in terms of application of the law, all persons are entitled to due process. All persons are entitled to equal protection. You won't need discrete insular minorities. You don't have to worry about these, these white people that have been in power, white men that have been in power for so long and now we're trying to push them, push them, push them to get to understand, to accept people. I think yeah, of, a, blind, uh, a blind applicant is not similarly situated to a sighted applicant. I, I agree. And I think that common sense would tell us we don't want blind people driving buses. Right. But on point, my point is we wouldn't have to have this, this, these weasel words if we simply just lived up to what it says there. I, I think of uh, the Father Hesburgh, Theodore Hesburgh, the longtime president of Notre Dame University that was uh, serving on the Civil Rights Commission in the 1960s or 1970s. I think it was uh, late 60s, early 70s. And he said, I'm so tired going from state to state trying to drag these states into the Constitution. <laughs> and that was just, that was like, yes. There it is, right there, because it all is set. And just go with the words. Well, back back to the levels of scrutiny for a second, because <laughs> uh, well, you know, again, like so this topic got so many different avenues we can, you know, jump off on. But I am wondering because we were we had this little conversation a while ago about women. This whole notion of intermediate scrutiny, you know, where does where does that come from, and how does the court look itself in the mirror? to say that women as, are they insular? And uh, what was the term there, Tim? Uh, insular discreet. And, and discreet, or they're not insular enough or discreet enough, uh, you know, uh, uh, there to have suspect. H how did the court rationalize this lower level of scrutiny uh, for women? Chris. Well, it goes back to 1976. And I think Craig V. Boren is the case, right? That, that begins that whole concept where they have to, to come up with another category, right? And why? So that, that's, that, that's my question too. That's my point. That's why I was ranting earlier. Why do they have to do this is because we can't seem to, because there's this gradualism, right? It, there's a gradualism at the heart of this question in terms of, ref, of a reflection of our culture. And, and Tim made that point from the jump to look at our culture, right? And so this, there's a gradualism in, our, in the shifting power base of white males from the very beginning to 2022. And in 1976, we're starting to think about, well, perhaps, perhaps we need to think about carving out a niche for, for gender as well, if that makes sense. Well, well intermediate, intermediate you know, uh, scrutiny, again, applies, yes. And we're not talking about, you know, being, you know, the blind bus driver here. You know, we're, we're saying that there are conditions in which women can be treated differently from men, can be discriminated against. Uh, you know, uh, if it, if it, and I'm trying to remember the language, uh, promotes, what, what's the language of intermediate, promotes a strong societal. It's, uh, it, it's two-pronged, two to serve an important government objective. Thank and you. And substantially, substantially related to achieving the objective. All right. And where would that, you know, I, I probably don't want to get too mired in that. Mike, do you have any thoughts on intermediate scrutiny? Because when I first read this question, the, the, the thing that jumped out at me is we, we need to get rid of intermediate scrutiny. Now, that, that's the one thing I definitely say. We, we need to get rid of that. But maybe I, I'm wrong. Mike, thoughts? 
Well, yeah, I'm not going to say too much because I, I need to do a little more reading on this. I don't want to lead astray. But I, my understanding is, is okay, these levels of scrutiny, they, they, they can do two things at the same time, right? So with, with, um, with race-based classifications, what that means under this jurisprudence is that if a government wants to enact a race-based classification that would somehow um, promote the, uh, the access to an institution that that race had not had access to, they're going to, the government's going to have to meet that super high standard, right? This is what we're going to get to with affirmative action. And with intermediate scrutiny, it makes it easier for governmental bodies. If you wanted to adopt an affirmative action like pro, uh, initiative that includes bases on, on sex, this, the, the level of scrutiny isn't as high. So it makes it easier for the government to do it. And again, this is where the students should check this out. But I really thought I learned that this was part of the strategy that I think Ruth Bader Ginsburg was, was involved with. I think she saw this as a strategy because she saw what had happened to the strict scrutiny. And I think this was her strategy when she started arguing these cases. I think I could be wrong on that, though. Well, then again, and that's an area that to guide students uh, in. So uh, we're, we're going to put Professor Moore into kind of referencing uh, meatloaf here, and we'll call it, you know, uh, uh, fops out of hell uh, uh, kind of thing, and that is presentism. Uh, there was a little bit of dissension on my notion that the, the, the big turning point was World War II, uh, you know, maybe a general consensus. I am wondering, Professor Moore, if you see any other elements of societal change, uh, especially in the 20th century, that led to this differing look at equality and equal protection beyond, I, to me, the event of World War II being, you know, this, this kind of opening our minds uh, kind of event. Well, I think, um, and, this, and this may get to uh, another set of questions that you have, but I think uh, culturally, there's the beginnings of our commitment to, uh, to pluralism. And I think that has a tremendous impact on how cultures see um, equality, whether they want to embrace it or whether they don't want to embrace it. And that may be a function of widespread immigration. I mean, from 1880 to, to 1920, uh, I, I think that's the most prominent phase of immigration that we had. Well, that's going to have tremendous impacts on how America sees itself as a culture. Uh, so, so I think um, there. I think you can't underestimate the amount of immigration and what that does in terms of people's thinking about whether uh, we're a unity or whether we can be a diversity. And and that's the that's the challenges beginning of of twentieth um, century pluralism theory. Would you Would you go so far as to say the change in immigration laws post World War II brought that much more to the <laughs> to the front of the line because. You know, we know that immigration late 19th, early 20th century is still predominantly European. Sure. But then we get the, what is it, the 1965 immigration, is it the 65 Immigration Act? There's a huge Immigration Reform right. Act in which now we're going to Asia and uh, South American or south of the border uh, kind of immigration. Does that change? Is that a societal change? Kind of a legal change that either reflects society or drives society? Is, well, is, I mean, the culture, the culture is scared to death uh, post-World War I, and uh, it's an, it, it, uh, I think there's a cultural response, and it's called uh, the Immigration Quota Act of 20, uh, 1924. So the first response to widespread immigration is, heck no, we, do, we don't want that kind of diversity. But, but I think uh, just the mere fact that there's so many different kinds of people coming in post-World War I, that's going to... Uh, not immediately, but I think it does play into our uh, uh, our beginnings of a of some sort of commitment to pluralism. Mike or Chris, any other things? You, I think immigration is a wonderful thing to focus on as um, far as you guys are going to help change. me out with this. Uh, what was? Oh gosh, I, I need to think to look this up. Uh, the Bracero program, the worker program, you know, coming across uh, people coming from Mexico to work. As, as migrant laborers 
And then as you get into the Eisenhower regime, I think it was called Operation, and for the students that are watching, I'm apologizing in advance for, but I'm going to use the language that was used by the Eisenhower regime, and that was Operation Wetback. And that was the idea of identifying Mexican migrant workers and, and sending them back because of the fear of competition, I think, with, uh, uh, you know, American migrant workers. And yeah, you guys, the, you, you Cali guys probably should know this better than me. I'll, I'll be honest, and, and I, I'm sorry to have this kind of very cynical, humor, humorous point of view, but I think maybe there's no group of people that, that have had to deal with schizophrenic America uh, than, uh, than Mexican, Mexican Americans. Because you think about it, all right, one, we have virtually no immigration policy with Mexico for decades, all right? Then we begin to clamp down post-World War I a little bit. Then the Great Depression, we really clamp down because obviously with agricultural jobs uh, and things, so, and, and we deport. World War II, boom, the Brissetto program, we need workers. So, hey, come, 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 come. And then post-World War II, Eisenhower, we say, oh, no, 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 go back, 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 back. And then the 1960s, come, 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 come. And then you, we've seen what's been going on since. It's, it's, a, it's a very kind of, talk about societal change, societal attitudes changing the notion of equal protection. I think our policy towards immigrants, especially uh, uh, Latino immigrants, has, uh, reflects the ebb and flow, both some might see positive and negative uh, views of societal change and equal protection. Mike? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you just nailed it there. I just want the students to be sure. We, whether you agree with the World War II argument or not, um, change is not linear. <laughs> and I don't think any of us are making the argument that it's been all roses since World War II. These things ebb and flow. And um, we'll put into, the, we'll put into the, the notes at the end, there's a wonderful survey by Pew that came out in 2019, arguing that more than ever, Americans are divided on the issue of race. I would encourage you students to look at the data on what Americans were saying to pollsters in the 1950s about race and what they're saying now. Because if you're gonna argue about societal change, you need some metrics, you need some empirics. And um, it, it just kind of feels like we need to acknowledge the time we're in right now, like what we've been going through the last few years. And it's not like, I don't think Americans think in terms of what do you think about equal protection? I think if you ask a black American do you think you have the same shot to live a, a, a quality life in America as a white person? Most blacks are gonna say no, right? That's really the kinds of questions you, the students need to be thinking about when they're looking at polling data and other ways to kind of get those metrics. Well, based on what you said and something that Tim referred to, I, I came across this Harvard Law Review article and it, the term was pluralism anxiety, that, that what we're seeing today all right, what we're seeing in the last 15 years or so is that we've become so pluralistic that it's become so complex. This notion of equality and equal protection and discrimination has become so complex because there's so many variety, there's such variety of groups, all right, that the, you know, that, that there are people, you guys have, have heard this as well, that you have conservatives latching on to Martin Luther King much more so than liberals in a lot of ways, right? And that is, we should judge you by the content of your character and not the color of your skin, all right? That's what this is all about. And th this author was saying that that's a byproduct of pluralism anxiety, is that we're so diverse now that the idea of, you know, government intrusion into both the market and even that which imposes upon state law and stuff like that has gotten so overwhelming uh, for people and, and, and the explosion of identity politics. Every group wants a seat at the table. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that's a, um, I see the plural, the narrowing of equal protection is an entirely predictable response to pluralism anxiety. In, in this sense, if, if, more and more people want in on the I'm a discrete and insular minority, or I am a, uh, uh, you, you know, I, I, I deserve first tier scrutiny. 
and there's more people making those claims, I can see the backlash uh, retreating to a more formalistic framework of equality. I see that as entirely predictable. But is it, okay, I, don't, I, I just don't know, I don't know the history of, of groups claiming that legal status. I was just thinking about like transgendered bathrooms. And isn't the argument there that if a government is gonna like, it's a fundamental right argument, isn't it? Or, wait, 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 what, what right are we talking about here? I'm trying to think of access to access to certain public accommodations. Or I, okay. I'm trying to think through of what well, that. Is. This gets somewhat complex, Mike. When you start to talk about transgender, I mean, it, 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 we can go back, you know, to, to Bowers, uh, as, as Chris had mentioned before. We can just go back you know, to gay and lesbian, right. right? And and laws that treated them. One of the arguments under equal protection was this, you know, this notion of immutability, immutability right. you know? Uh, and the argument that I used to confront all the time is, well, you're not born gay, it's a choice. And therefore choices that people make should not guarantee equal protection under the law. Now, when you get to religion as, a fundamental right protected under su suspect class uh, there. It gets real interesting there. But I, I think, you know, transgender brings up the same issue and, and the same discomfort and challenge we have as society is, is understanding the biological science behind, be, be, behind transgender, you know, there. And, and, and I don't know, does that make any sense? It does. I, I think, I think the, the, depending on what the law is, you would make different arguments, right? If a state comes up with a law saying that the, someone who identifies as transgendered is not allowed to marry, then what you're going to argue is there's a fundamental right to marry, no matter whether I'm transgender, black, white, right? That, it's going to depend on what the law is forbidding, how the right. law is discriminating. Is, is access to a restroom a fundamental right? I was raising it more. I was not answering that. Uh, no, I, I know. I, mean, <laughs> I wish I wish we we would edit this sometimes because that was literally just like it's right, in well, my the head. question becomes: I'm are you, out, They'll let it come out, and then I just said it without knowing the answer. It's, it's okay. a public accommodation. Yeah, of course, it's a fundamental right, right? Yeah, I don't know if it. Well, I don't know if it's a fundamental right given our current, you know, the two prong test to determine the fundamentalness of a right. But of course, but you know, the idea of public accommodations. It is a, it's a basic human right, regardless of how you identify. It is a basic human right. And when you're going to not allow a group of people to access a basic human right because the way they identify makes other people uncomfortable, then we have a problem. So we gotta, we're coming up against the end of our, our program here. Of course, let's, let's save the best for last and let's, uh, uh, yeah, we'll start off with you again, uh, Professor Williams. Uh, at, at the forefront of all this, at least right now in this uh, this year of the Supreme Court, is is a program that was started back when I was, I think, in high school or middle school, and that is affirmative action. Uh, and affirmative action, at least in its original uh, in a construct, was it was that race needed and and it, it included gender as well, uh, but needed to be considered. Uh, in some governmental policies, uh, admissions, uh, employment, government contracts, things uh, like that. But isn't any program that considers race as a factor in determining distribution of resources automatically suspect and therefore in violation of the Equal Protection Clause? Um, most of that I agree with. If, if you're using race, if you're discriminating based on race and legislation, whether it's for, some would call this like a benign, like you're doing it to promote what you think is a healthy public good. Yes, it means you're gonna to have to fulfill the, like you're gonna to have to show a compelling state interest. Now with education, since Baki, right? And then later with Gruder and some others, they've said if, a, if an educational institution says we, we need more people who are non-white because we need diversity and diversity is important for learning, the court has said, Race can be one factor, you can't use quotas, and that fulfills compelling, compelling state interest. So yes, all that is accurate. Um, before Chris and Tim just chime in, I just want the students to know, 
you know, again, South Africa in their constitution took a totally different stance on this. And South Africa said, they basically have like an equal protection kind of like clause, but they say, look, um, if we want to enact legislation that is going to positively advance those who have been discriminated in the past, we, we, we're allowing that. So they allow for affirmative action in the constitutional text because they had a, you know, in the 1990s, they looked at their political, cultural, economic context and said, we need to do this. We don't have that, we don't have that sort of escape clause in our, in our analysis. If you use race as a factor, you have to show compelling state interest. And it, it could be, it, it cannot be remedial, right? It cannot be societal wide. You wanna just, you wanna promote more blacks in an institution because society has discriminated against. You can't do that. You can do it if you show, if this institution has discriminated specifically and you can show that, but it can't be just a general wide sort of action. I think I just can everyone. It's gotta be narrowly tailored. Yes. There's the terminology students you have to think about programs. It must be narrowly tailored for accomplishing uh, the goal, which would be promoting diversity. Well, taking a historical view, Chris, of affirmative action in its original construct with Johnson, and he made a speech at a university using kind of the metaphor of a race and, and, and looking at racial relations in the United States that, you know, that, that African-Americans in this, in this foot race had you know been you know tied, uh, chained uh, you know and there and, and you know so at that at that moment in time in the late '60s, if you do you just take off the, the 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 chains and say okay now we have equal protection, even though in the race of life African Americans are so far behind, so affirmative action was a program and it was intended to be short term. I'm not sure it was it not it was not intended to be permanent was to have governmental policies that would bring those insular minorities uh, uh, up to the same point as the majority, all right, specifically white males uh, there, and then government would get out of the business, all right? Is that, is that a correct understanding of what, what affirmative action was intended to do? Yeah, I mean, quite simply, is the, the, the buzz phrase was to right past wrongs, right? To correct past wrongs, and then you're talking about equality of condition versus equality of opportunity, um, to use the Johnson uh, metaphor of a race, because of so many people, because of whatever classification they might have fallen into, were actually not starting at the starting line, right? Um, but we also know that when the gun goes off and the race starts, st people are still somewhat hamstrung, uh, given um, the current situation of things. Um, I, I always liken it to, a, there's a, a, a great uh, short story by Indiana's own Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, it's called The Handicapper General. And it's actually, he's, he's ripping on communism, right? He's, he, he's in the or Orwellian mode of ripping on communism, but it's very similar in terms of like, um, you know, people are given uh, certain uh, like weights to carry around if they're faster or stronger. And it really fits into this concept of equality of condition versus equality of opportunity. Um, but I think that, you know, um, that was the intention of it in terms of affirmative action to right those past wrongs, to allow people, whether it be based on gender or ethnicity or whatever it may be, that have traditionally been the insular minorities that Tim spoke of earlier, that traditionally don't get to toe the line like other people to right those past wrongs. Now, and you're right, David, they were only supposed to last for a while, but, you know, we- Well, and, 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 and Justice O'Connor addressed that in the Michigan case by saying, we're just not there yet. Right. You know, I, I don't know how much longer, but we're not there yet, uh, uh, there. So Professor Moore, you get kind of the closing thoughts here uh, on this. Well, I think, uh, uh, thank you. You're um, welcome. I can't help but think that that uh, culturally, I think Americans, if the, if we want to put a formal uh, label on this, um, what we've been talking about certainly in the last ten minutes or so is this idea of is there such a thing as substantive equal protection? Um, 
which, uh, and, and if students can look this up, and there's all kinds of literature out there on this, on this concept of equal protection, substantive equal protection. Most time, most time people think it's like substantive due process, but there's a whole legal literature out there on this, and it has a lot to do with equal protection means recognizing past sins, uh, policies that are redistributive, there's where the affirmative action kicks in. Uh, policies that increase participation in the political process. That's all about John Hart Ely's uh, uh, book years ago. And then transforming social structures. So I think the American culture, when I think there's always going to be a culture at a minimum nervousness about substantive equal protection because uh, it's, it can be very easily seen as, as radical and, and, uh, and revolutionary, especially in its redistributive prong. I, I, as I understand it, there's, there's four prongs to this theory. So it's the redistributive part that really culturally uh, makes Americans nervous. And I think it's all about you know, my, my wallet and, and my, uh, my property, really. And, there, and that's a deep cultural tradition as well. So I, maybe as a concluding statement, students should maybe look into substantive equal protection theory, because it's fascinating uh, how complex, and even advocates of it will admit that it's, it, gets very, uh, it gets very squishy uh, <laughs> in, how it's, in how it's applied. Well, students and teachers and uh, those who are generally curious about the Constitution, hopefully we've shown just how complex uh, <laughs> and difficult it is to have a brief conversation on the Equal Protection <laughs> Clause, discrimination, tears of scrutiny, uh, uh, and the whole kit and caboodle of, uh, of the 14th Amendment. Uh, hopefully we've shown that uh, tonight. Uh, hopefully we've given you some guidelines, some, uh, some areas to think about. Uh, uh, so we will be back uh, sometime soon. Uh, our next topic uh, is going to be a favorite of uh, Professor Kavanaugh's. We're going to be looking at rebellion uh, here and because uh, he is the rebel amongst us. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we're going to be uh, asked to look at January 6th and how that fits in the scheme of American history and uh, rebellion. Uh, until then, we look forward to seeing you. Peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.